because they were, you know, somebody had put, somebody had put them in, in a, um, um, like volunteers probably, cut them out, the newspaper articles, and put them in just a, in a little scrapbook. And uh, they were, so it was really quite amazing. Of course, they were all yellowed and everything. And um, now, as you might imagine, a place like the San Diego Zoo has a lot of amazing animal stories. And, uh, and yet this one was like ridiculously amazing. Um, and it was the way that they got their first um, dress. And it was the first ones in Southern California, actually, as I understand it. Um, and they, uh, and what it started it all out was the fact that what the first, first paragraph I read about the, in an article said that they, they survived a hurricane. And as you know, you know, that's how I start the book too. And then they were put out in what was little more than a tricked out pickup truck. And, uh, and they were driven across country to the San Diego Zoo. Now this is before interstates. And uh, this was, before, you know, uh, like it took 12 days. And uh, act, there was actually only like one bridge, you know, uh, and it, it took that long and it was just, uh, just remarkable. And I just kept, my jaw just kept dropping and, and with all the articles. And as they, as they went across country, newspapers picked up the stories. And it was um, a remarkable thing. And as, as, you know, as you remember from the book, uh, this was happening while Hitler was, you know, in, invading countries already. And, and uh, the, of course, the Great Depression was going on. And uh, there was all kinds of wonderful, awful things uh, I mean, uh, happening. Um, but uh, there was very little, I said uh, wonderful, but there was very little wonderful going on. And the wonderful thing was that, that these giraffes seemed to be lightening everybody's load across the country. It just, it was amazing. There ended up being like 500 of them. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to see 30 of them. Now, um, at the time I was a professional writer and, um, and a freelance journalist. And, um, and essentially I was not yet a novelist. Now I had my literary pretensions and I wanted this to happen, but it hadn't happened yet. So um, I just looked for a diary. You know, I was thinking, well, wouldn't this be great as a nonfiction book if I could find a diary of the zookeeper that pulled this thing off? And, uh, you know, I found out, I came to the conclusion that when I didn't find one, that, you know, these guys back then were not the kind of guys who, who, who wrote in diaries. So uh, I had to let it go. And I finished the, the uh, book project that I was doing for them about their uh, visionary zoo director um, at the time, um, which by the way, all the zoos across the country uh, was affected by that man. They, if, you, if, you, if you don't, if you have a moat anywhere in your, um, in your zoos, that's your ones that you've gone to see, that's because of this man. So in essence, um, what I then uh, had to give it up, right? So I finished the project and uh, 12 years went by and I became a novelist during that time, a published novelist. And, um, and I, um, I uh, got a call about that same year and the, um, it was the, the zoo CEO and he was asking me if I wanted to come back and um, write the history of San Diego Zoo for their centennial, which was coming up in 2016. And of course, I could not say yes fast enough on that one. And, uh, and in essence, what I wound up finding myself, I found myself back in the archives and I found myself looking at those, that, that wonderful story again. And this time, of course, I was taking pictures of it, right? You know, and you, you know, at that point I was having to delicately touch them. They, they were, I had to put on gloves and everything. So I was taking pictures of all those 30. And I began to wonder if I might be able to write a uh, piece of fiction around this, but I'd have to, there was huge gaps in the story so I would have to come up with a lot of things. And of course I should, if I'm, you know, if I was a creative person, I should be able to come up with, um, with the characters. I had one or two solid characters and then I'd have to come up with everything else. Now, 
the think about also the reason one of the other, other impetus is this for doing that is that at that same time we were all beginning to understand about the extinction uh, crisis that we're going through um, now back then uh, believe it or not they just went out into the wild and pick things you know like up uh, just pick pick stuff up and took them back to the zoo. The Navy, for instance, the Navy was all over the world, right? And the Navy was right there at San Diego Zoo. And they would just, you know, they'd have a, like pick up a bear or somewhere and it became a mascot and then it got too big. And so they would donate it to the zoo. And, you know, crazy stories like, you know, how they, that was one of the very first bears they ever had in not back in 1916. And yeah, you know, they put him in a Model T and drove him to the zoo. I mean, you know, so crazy stuff. This is story after story, which is pretty amazing. But again, nothing as amazing as that, that giraffe story. So at that time, um, uh, I realized that what I really wanted to do was try to make some sort of a impact on, um, uh, on the situation. Uh, because I got very sad thinking, and we, as we all are, about the fact that we might be losing some of our most uh, beloved uh, species. I mean, pandas, elephants, giraffes, you know, and I uh, wanted to try to make a dent in that in some fashion. And uh, um, I wanted that to be uh, the underlying idea. So I ended up realizing that the way to do that would be to have someone this age uh, who rem was remembering something. And now when I say this age, I mean alive at this time. And so I said it in the future, two, three years ahead. And, uh, and I had it be a 105 year old man because there are more and more, more and more centurions out there. And uh, I thought this might be a pretty good thing, a pretty good way to get into this. And he would be remembering it, and he'd be wanting to put this down before he before he left us, and and he also had to have a good reason to do that. So as you know, as you know, if you finish the book, you know you found out what who he was writing to. So uh, in essence, I had all this uh, kind of set up. Um, plus, I'd also during that time between the time that I was there at the zoo, I'd also done a lot of travel writing. So a road trip excited me. I mean, I love road trips, you know? So essentially I love any kind of trips. So at that point, I even, uh, even enjoyed the research uh, that as you might imagine, first I, I've also had to, not only is it going to be a road trip, but it had to also uh, evoke the, um, the, the time and the place, which meant a lot of research too. But, but I got to tell you there, that was fascinating research. Normally I get antsy and I want to stop the research and start, dry, start, start writing, but I just found myself enamored and I kept on, you know, getting further down and further into it. And so I realized that, that I really needed to bring everything I possibly could into it from all that research, for instance, like the Dust Bowl, which is a huge thing that we're going to be driving through it. So, you know, why not have this, uh, this boy that, was, that was, had become an orphan because of the Dust Bowl, uh, why not have him end up being in that truck somehow? And then why not have, um, uh, when you're driving cross country, you're gonna have uh, going through some things, these things called sundown towns, which I'm not, I'm sure you now know if you've read the book, what they are. And, um, and then of course, you'd have to talk about, I and mean, I certainly wanted to talk about, what it was like to be a woman back then. And I don't think we have a real grasp at all about how far we have come. Now, you know, if you've, you know, my age, anywhere near it, you're a child of the sixties and you know, you, you saw a lot of things happening and a lot of things changing at that time for both women and for, for, uh, for African-Americans. And essentially we kind of know what we saw and what we've experienced, but to, to know what she went through and what, what my red, my, uh, my female protagonist, um, she had to embody everything, but she wasn't going to embody, of course, what the women were back then. She was going to embody what 
she wanted to be because of course she knew she would, she didn't have long to live and uh and that of course i had to add that just so you know we would have be able to give her she had a a, tick, a ticking clock so she had to if she was going to have an adventure she was going to have to have it now and boy did she ever you know and uh, of course i loved loved uh, red and and uh, I saw myself a lot in it, of course, and uh, uh, would like to think that I'd be a little bit like her if, uh, and I think we all probably wish we, we could be like her sometime. So uh, fast forward, um, I'm now, uh, I decided that I, I could do a lot of things if I just got to it. So I started filling up a whiteboard and um, I got to say, it took almost a year to decide what the plot was. And um, I think, um, Belinda, did you say you had that whiteboard? You want to pop it up there? Just in case, just for a minute. And then we can always go back to it if anybody has some questions about it. But, whoa, yes, there it is. So uh, you are now looking into the tortured mind of a writer. <laughs> yeah. So believe it or not, think of it as, as, as starting out with a, with a whiteboard. There was nothing on it. And here I am trying to decide. You can see where I went from the left and uh, went uh, along and put you know, the, every state that we were going to go through. And, and I started adding what we were going to happen, what was going to happen in each state. And um, but I also, if you know anything about creative writing, if you enjoy this at all, um, I made a point of also reminding myself that at the beginning, it's supposed to be inciting action. That's when you start. And then there's rising action when you, when you develop everything. And then there's a point of crisis, the emotional climax. And then, of course, you go down and you end up in the denouement and um, technical climax. So in essence, again, just thought you might get a kick out of seeing this. And, uh, and uh, I would ask myself questions all over it. All the little scribbles of questions that I needed to answer if I was really gonna do this. If you notice the green, the colors are different for the different, uh, the green is the old man, red is red, of course, and blue is woody. So there you go. Like I said, we are writers and nuts. But at this point, I just finally one day just decided to start writing because I felt pretty good at it. That's, that's that. Linda, I have a question. Yeah. I have a question from someone who I think is a good time to ask this. Rather than writing it in chronological order from beginning to end, you sort of did it in flashbacks as a memoir. Yes. How did, why did you choose that method? Okay. Well, um, one of the things that happened with this is I, I did it in chronological order to begin with. And uh, the, the process of selling, unpublished, of selling a novel to be published is excruciating. And <laughs> if you've ever gone through it, it's, it can be quite a thing. So I got um, two or three, um, the first batch, you only do two or three at a time. And the first batch, the responses were all, you know, well, this is really interesting, but it's, you know, it's just doesn't really pop. Now, I could have just let that go and I could have uh, just kept on, just send it to other people, which is probably the same thing to do. <laughs> but in essence, I did not do that. I started thinking, well, you know what? The only way I'm really going to underscore about um, the extinction crisis is to have it uh, as a flashback. Those you have it now. So that's really the major reason I did it. I went ahead, not just to see if it could be published the way it was. And of course, you know, what you have here is the flashbacks are the only thing new. What you read, the entire book, that was what that was at the beginning. Uh, so I haven't really messed with that at all, but uh, hardly at all. Um, but what I ended up doing was adding what I call, a, what it's, it is called a frame story. And a frame story allows you to, uh, like it's an entire flashback, essentially, is what you're doing. But to do it really well, I couldn't just, um, I need to, you needed to kind of see that he was struggling with this because he is so old. So I had, uh, I felt like I needed to come 
uh, bring in, come back and forth, back and forth. And when I did that, bringing him back to him, trying to write, get this down and having visions, of course, you know, he sees, he sees, you know, a girl in the, the giraffe in the window on the fifth floor mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. And he's going in and out and, uh, and, you know, a bit of a uh, unreliable narrator, but you know, what I've what I told the kids this morning when I was doing my school uh, the author visit, um, they uh, asked about that. And I just said that, you know, it's, it, it, it's one of them asked if this was an unreliable narrator. And I said, well, yes, it is. Except that I really see him as a reliable, unreliable narrator, if you understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> He's pretty close to, he was remembering it pretty well. But, it, but, his, but his memories were going to be the only thing we ever had. So we had to kind of believe it. And uh, he got pretty specific, as you know. You know, I made him, he had to be very specific. So uh, that uh, kind of helped the feeling too. But anyway, essentially, so what I did, I, I and also I, at that point realized that the best ending would be the beginning. Uh, and you saw that happen too. Um, I, I used the same... Um, sort of um, opening to end it. And then I ended up realizing that I, I essentially had to, I had to let him go. I had to have him decide to let go. And that's essentially what they say happens with older people anyway, the ones they have, um, they sometimes just, they, they have to give, they have to decide to just let go before they will die. And he did not want to do that until he had this down, story down. So that's essentially one of the, the, the major reasons. The major reason was I wanted to make a comment about the extinction crisis, but I also wanted to give Woody his due as an adult. You know, I wanted him to have, he was going to be the narrator anyway, first person. I hope that answers the question. So we look at all of these notes and all the research that you did, and I know you ended up having to edit down a lot. Was there anything that you really hated to say goodbye to as you were editing that you thought was important, but it just couldn't all work there? Do you know someone asked me that this morning too? I'm kind oh, of impressed with y'all. How about that? I know, I'm impressed with y'all. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, interestingly enough, um, it was 100,000 words. Now the average, the average novel is about 75. And... In fact, if it's under 50,000, it's, it's called a novella. It is not called a novel. Hmm. So a 75,000 uh, was pretty much what I started out thinking I would get to. But I had, look what I had to work with, right? I had, every, you know, this whole, all these states, and I had all these adventures. Every, every chapter had an adventure, right? And, you know, good and bad, and, 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 had, and they were tempted, and it just had to all to have all these things happen. And I had to also pack in all the social and political, you know, uh, situations back then. And, um, and so I essentially just um, uh, kind of uh, found out that I was, I ended up, when I, when I sold it, I sold it at 110,000 words, <laughs> 110,000 words. So um, I was not at a loss for words, obviously, but um, get this, my uh, editor told me that I had to cut it down by 10,000 words. And at that point, I you know, was about to rebel because I did not want to um, lose any of my uh, words. And uh, then I realized, well, I, I actually uh, was, was essentially, uh, before I was, um, um, a uh, you know a novelist. Um, in fact, my first first uh, real job as a writer was as a um, uh, copywriter, and I found out that uh, I was given the project. I, I gave them two thousand words on this thing, and I was told that I had to cut that down to six thousand six hundred. And I didn't thought that was going to be crazy. I didn't know how I was going to do that because I, if I have every, you know, as you might imagine, I'm loquacious and I had lots of words, you know. So how are you going to cut that down? Well, I found out that's when you find out that you, you whether you are really a writer or not, because what I thought I started enjoying it. That what I found that is that that 600 words 
was better. And in fact, it was a lot better. And I learned that the second round, the first draft is not that great. You're just getting down an idea. But the second draft is where you really start learning your craft and you, and you use your craft. And, um, and I have to say that um, what I did with the 10,000, you know, my trick was I had a trick. I didn't want to lose any adventure. I wasn't going to lose anything. So I went back and remembered that 600 word thing, word lesson. And I just took out words. I just, I didn't even, I didn't, you know, I'd pick out a sentence here, maybe a sentence there, a few words here. Oh, there's too many adjectives in that. So I'll just take them out. And I got down to a um, hundred thousand, you know, at the end of it, it was very interesting. I got down, uh, I, I kept watching the numbers, you know, as I got closer to the end and I was really surprised that it worked. I pulled that off and that's essentially what it was. So no, I did not get to have to cut a thing uh, really Good. except all the extra. Okay, we have another question. Uh, such interesting characters. Who was your favorite and why? Uh, <laughs> that was asked this morning too. Really? Yellow, yeah, yellow crazy. Crazy, yeah. this is crazy, this is fun. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of these Zooms. I've done a lot of these Zooms. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, this would have been in person if it had been in another time, uh, if we'd been able to decide now. I'm, I'm about next week to go in person for my very first one, only because they asked me about a month ago, you know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, um, I have to say um, that um, what I'm doing, uh, when, I, when, I'm, when, I'm, when you're writing, the, okay, the writerly answer is I love them all because they're all me. You know, there's some of them I've, I've been asked, you know, uh, who, which one is uh, your favorite, you know, in the sense that uh, which one are you, are you most like or something. And uh, but the, this is the same. It's kind of the same question. And I think um, what I I really feel is, um, you know, I had to I had to kind of create a bunch of guys doing this because guys are the ones that had adventures back then, right? Unless you were Margaret Bourke White, you know, and, and uh, Amelia Earhart maybe, you know, uh, but, but overall it was the uh, man. Um, and um, I decided that the, that the woman, there had to be a woman because uh, she was gonna be epitomize what was happening with women at the time and what she had to, and she had to balk at things. She had to not, not uh, be what society was asking her to be at the time. And, uh, and of course, that's again, I gave her romantic fever so she would uh, feel that clock ticking and, and she knew she, she was gonna do anything she had to do it now. So I guess if my answer really is anything, it would be that uh, um, I, I, I love them all, but I, maybe I love red more a little bit. Someone did mention Red in their question, and they said your inspiration for her was phenomenal. And they wanted to know why you portrayed her loss of her dreams uh, rather than the Margaret Bork white success story. Really? Well, uh -huh. oh, okay. That Would you kind of answer that a bit? But you want to round on it? Uh, well, I have to. Um, uh, we're having, so, you know, the, the book, we're, I'm having such fun all the way across. They're all having fun, but they're also being tempted all the way across right they're all being tempted uh they're all showing the worst side of themselves and then they pull themselves up at, you know from that and make the right choices now um if you notice um um she not only well, she pretty much saves the day you know i let red save the day with uh and, and with the flash flood they would not, you know, they wouldn't have made it without Red, but Red had to sacrifice to do that. It wouldn't have mean, meant writerly wise, it would not have meant as much literarily if it didn't cost her anything. Uh, and, you know, that's essentially, it had to cost her something and what it had to cost her, I could only make, I could only uh, think was it had to cost her all her pictures. Now she was lying, you know, at the time, and we she got caught in her lie. But you know, as a freelance, I mean, nobody's ever asked me this one, but 
I, I'm, I'm, I used to be a photographer. Uh, I, I, my travel writing, I uh, would take pictures uh, and I, you know, got them published and it was quite wonderful. I have them on my wall now, you know, to remind me. But, but um, and so I know my way around uh, cameras. But I have to uh, say that um, that the the reason that she the reason that she had to have uh, have she couldn't be success is because she had it had to cost her now and and because she also um, needed to not be uh, not be there at the end of the story because she was going to get caught in her lie. And that wasn't going to work out. Now, why did I do that? That's probably your question. Why did I not let her just have uh, success at that, at least? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, it, boy, wouldn't it have been great? Now, as a freelance writer and photographer, I knew, you know, first, if I didn't have the pictures, that's what Live Magazine was about. If I didn't have the pictures, I would, couldn't do the article. Or at least they'd have to do some stock pictures. They could, I could have gotten around my little small situation. But... But she couldn't because that was her whole thing. And if I hadn't uh, uh, set up, if I it had allowed her to go on to, and, and it had been wonderful, and she would have it sold the pictures to life, um, then again, there wouldn't have been as much drama. And there wouldn't have been that sacrifice that, that showed her, her true nature. Mm -hmm. You would not think as much of her as what I'm saying, I guess. Uh, you would think of her as this lying woman who was putting herself above everything, you know, uh, and uh, and putting her ventures, which we've all done, of course, at some point, I, we've done that. But when it came down to it, when it came right down to it, she didn't even think about it. She just hauled her that, that, that stolen uh, car right in there and saved the day. And uh, if she did that, Again, she had to have a sacrifice, or it wouldn't have meant as much. So I, you know, I, uh, uh, and it wouldn't have been. I gotta tell you, you know, one of the things that you that you battle with when you write is, uh, you know, I have a, I have a couple of too many literature degrees, right? So I think at this point, it's it's uh, maybe I've, I'm a little too overread. You know, I'm, frankly, I can't I can't really at this age. I one of the reasons I wrote this is because I really you know, couldn't, didn't want to write, read anything heavy, you know, so I decided just to create something that I'd want to read, which is, every writer should probably do that, try to do that, uh, and just instead of trying to do something that you're not, um, and, um, and I tend to be, again, kind of an upbeat person, and I, uh, and I want things to be upbeat, however, so having said that, here I am with this ending, you know, and with, you know, what did I, why did I do that? And I think it's because I wanted it to feel realistic. I wanted everything to be sacrificed. I wanted everybody to, to, I wanted it to be as realistic as possible. And yet I wanted you to feel good about it. Now that's going to be a trick to pull off. And I'm hoping at least I got close to doing that for you. Uh, I did want to remind folks who are on with us that they can click on Q&A if they have questions and type those in and we'll get those out for you. So please join us. Uh, we have others that have come in. Um, the Dust Bowl. Did you do a lot of research about the Dust Bowl? And what did you find about kids who were living there, you know, and what was their lives like during well, that time? Uh, um, at the end of the book, just... I don't know if y'all read the acknowledgements, mm -hmm. um, but it, you, I, I, um, I tell one of the, some of the things that I researched and uh, used as a research, uh, and one of those was called the worst hard time, and it won the Pulitzer somewhere around the 2015, 13, something like that, and uh, of course I had that wonderful book. And it talked about tumbleweed soup and it talked, I mean, it just talked about all of these amazing things. And of course, you know, uh, that's why I had to acknowledge it. And, uh, and as well as those other books um, and uh, like Green Book, for instance, uh, which there's been a movie, you know, it's named that and, and, and referenced that of course since, but, um, but at the time it was something that I researched and it was called, it was real, it's what it was called back then. And um, so in essence, 
um, uh, the worst hard time gave me all I really ever needed for that. But I, but I didn't really, but I had more because I actually had people, I, for instance, this is crazy. I actually <laughs> mentioned that I was writing, I played something called pickleball, which is crazy. Thing. Uh -huh. And I wish some of y'all know about it by now, but yes. um, my, uh, this was a couple of years ago. This is back before it was huge. And um, uh, it was someone I met there uh, asked me what I was doing. And I had, of course, I had the other novel and they you know, knew about that. And I told them about this and she actually gave me something that her mother had written about when bums would come to her door, you know, just about that whole experience. And so I had things like that mm -hmm. to just, that really almost gave me chills. It gave me, it was just surreal. Um, and what it was really like for these people back then and how they would just disappear, you know, um, they would just walk away, you know, just, and you'd never hear from these people again. And, um, and, you know, that's, that's how uh, dis uh, in despair they were. And um, so I think, you know, things like that, the research was just, it's also is what makes it real. Not only is it that you want to not make everything happy, happy, you want to, thread the needle in the sense of making it real, but also making it, um, uh, uh, let's just say you want it to be something that's uplifting, you know, and that's essentially what I was always working for. Okay, thank you. So with Woody's experiences with the drafts, what do they teach us about devotion and kindness and patience and determination and Giraffes? Mm -hmm. giraffes? Woody and his giraffes. Mm -hmm. What do they teach us? What do mm -hmm. they teach Woody? Um, uh, well, um, I'm not sure how to answer that. It, to me, it's um, uh, what do they teach us is, is pretty on the nose. I can, uh, I think at that point, uh, just uh, have, uh, here's the question to ask. You okay. Know, all of you, uh, raise your hand. I will not see it, but raise your hand <laughs> if, uh, if you have been around a giraffe, have you seen a giraffe? I mean, almost most of us have at least seen a giraffe, right? And I don't know how, I don't know how you respond to them, but um, and as you might imagine, I was around a lots and lots of, of um, zoo animals. Um, and yet um, what I felt interestingly enough was um, I was always mesmerized, for instance, by the Galapagos tortoises at the San Diego Zoo. Oh my gosh, if you ever have a chance to receive a I, I'm about to go back there for a speaking engagement soon. And um, in essence, um, I will definitely go by and see my tortoises. But, but the giraffes, um, and also they have something there that uh, they actually have, um, like I mentioned at the end of the book, they have a park out in the high desert where the people are the ones that are enclosed and, and, the, the, and the animals run free. And that's where I see the giraffes, you know, out there. And, um, but in essence, in essence what I, where, I was going, where I was going with this was that elephants, for instance, are marvelous, marvelous creatures. It's just, they're incredibly uh, intelligent, but they kind of make me sad to be around them because I know that they're gonna go extinct because we don't have room for them. And we you know, got a lot of people on this planet now and we don't have enough wild space for elephants. So they will, no doubt, I hope not in our lifetimes, but I have a feeling they're gone and, um, and everyone's worried about that, but those are, they're so big and they're wonderful, but they're so big. Giraffes on the other hand made me happy. And I can, I try to understand why um, and it has something to do with the way they um, held themselves, the serenity involved in it. Uh, people talk about the serenity that they feel around them, not just me, but it's essentially um, there's, they, they give off uh, a feeling of otherworldness. And um, in that, um, in that feeling, uh, I, I think I would say that being around them as much especially as Woody did as you notice he changed his mind totally about about them mainly because 
he had always had a feeling about animals anyway, that they, that he you knew they had more soul than most of the humans he knew. And he allowed that to come back because of the giraffes and they you know, changed his, his mind uh, and um, you know awakened his soul. And I think that what animals do for us is somewhat like that. And we're gonna be so much the poorer, poorer if uh, we don't try to save these uh, animals. You know, if we don't have animals in our lives, um, it, just a dog alone, just what those dogs do for us. I mean, you know, cats and just, it's fascinating what they do to us, uh, do for us. And, and it's hard to put into words what that is. But um, what I think they do is what, what the drafts did for, for um, Woody is to remind him, and I love this idea, to remind them um, of their own humanity and to remind them of the best part of themselves, mainly because they, as I think I have an old man say that animals live by a whole other voice, live by a whole other voices than ours. They, they don't, they don't live in the same, they live in the same world, but they don't in one sense. And, uh, and we, if we can learn from that, then we'd be, we would benefit. Thank you. And here's the question, a little different path. We're going to take your debut novel was a, was contemporary fiction, and then you moved to this historic fiction. How's it? How is that writing process different when you're doing that? Oh Anything? well, less research, <laughs> lots of less research. <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, it was um, I took mostly from my uh, own experience growing up in small town Texas in the first one and um and I also um had a couple of reasons that a couple of things happened that kind of inspired that but um the huge difference is uh research and um here's the thing I think most people who try to do historical fiction they err because they don't do enough research. And they, you, it's very, it becomes very obvious uh, when um, a story didn't really delve, uh, a writer didn't really delve with the story yeah, into it. You, you start getting it pretty easy, pretty fast that, the, mm -hmm. that they got lazy. Um, so, one of the things that, I mean, I, it added several years to, to this process, but of course, you know, it's been worth it because I get to talk to people like you and, <laughs> and have a lot of fun, but, uh, and also hopefully make some sort of an impact. But um, I think that uh, the biggest difference is research. You, you don't just take from your own experience. And of course, by this age, I have enough experience in all kinds of things that I, you know, I could go off in many directions. But if I'm going back in time, I better be prepared to really uh, do the research. And thankfully, I like the research. So, was in, and this is my question were you really concerned about endangered animals? And that was sort of the impetus for the book, or was it that the book made you really? become aware of, uh, of the troubles? Well, um, actually, I think it was, um, it was the endangered species first, but, oh, but seriously, I mean, in 1999, when I found that story, I really was ready to do something with it if I could find more. Mm -hmm. And um, it would have been a whole different, part. well, I was a whole different person, but the book would have definitely been a whole different book. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't find anything. So again, I had to let it go. Um, but I have to say um, that what you have is what you have is then is um, um, you just need to kind of decide what it is that you want to say. And um, and I think what I really wanted to say by the time I got to it was something about the sixth, sixth extinction. I wanted to try to have some sort of impact. And, uh, you know, even I explained that, you know, my frame story was about that and that I added it only after being told that, you know, well, it was a nice story, but, eh, you know, uh, by a couple of uh, publishers before we moved on, that 
I realized I had a moment that I could do what I really wanted to do, that I wanted to, and I could make more of a point. I was mm-hmm. making the point, I thought, because you'd, tell, you'd write a story, read a story like that, and you would think, gee, I wonder how the drafts are doing, you know, the, today in, in the world. But I could really point at it. And if I, if I put the frame story in it and what's happening to us now, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that's uh, kind of how I went at it. So I was, it was really that I was, uh, was more endo- you know, worried about the endangered species than anything. Um, by the time I got to, by the time I got to, to writing this anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, did you another? Okay. Can you tell us anything about your next writing project? Oh, well, it's, I'm having to do research about it. <laughs> that should tell you it's a historical novel. Um, uh, well, I can tell you this, that um, it's, um, it's got a softball game in it. And it's sitting not pickleball? <laughs> no, soft, no, not pickleball. Uh, softball, um, it's got a softball game in it. It's got a, um, it's 1964. It's got a drugstore sit-in. It's got a uh, pastor feud, and uh, it's in a tiny, tiny, tiny little town. Um, and uh, it's a Texas town, of course. And, um, and it's really about friendship. And, um, oh, it's also got um, things like, it's got uh, 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 the fastest woman in the world in it, actually. She comes up into it a lot because of this one girl that has a real gift and it becomes more of a thing it's and it's also about books too so see it's well welcome to my mind you know like I can't do just one thing we've got about seven things in there right but that's that's um that's essentially what makes me happy um and to have all these different complications and pop them on and try to make something out of it in one book but um uh, I will say that what it is, is uh, after saying all that, is that it's, um, it's about, um, it's going to be about um, the power of books, and it's going to be about uh, the, um, the hope of, um, of great um, uh, talent, and it's also going to be about um, the courage to um, be who you are. Great, we'll see. Okay, I see we have another question coming up. It's gonna be out, I hope, in a couple of years. Well, we'll be looking forward to it. Trust right, good. Yeah, okay, here's one. Um, this participant said that I love the book, but I couldn't help wondering about all the giraffe poop in the crate, <laughs> especially when the Red poop? and Woody climbed in there. You know, somebody actually emailed me to say to tell me that. Really? <laughs> See, yeah, this, I mean, it was like, you know, and then the he said, oh, book by, person here. He said, yeah, oh, by the way, I like the book, you know, but he, <laughs> he said, you forgot to talk about, you know, having him take the poop out. And, you know, he's right. <laughs> I should have, <laughs> I should have said, I should have had Woody doing this, you know, you know, but I didn't, I didn't even think about that. So again, you know, a piece of literature, if it had been real, uh-huh. <laughs> we'd have talked about poop a lot. So that wasn't about your one of your ten thousand words, huh? Uh, no, 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 no. I did cut no. it out. I just tried it. You know, I forgot that. And that would have been perfect to add to that. You know, it'd have been fun. So this one is referencing the town that the flat tire happened, where they had their flat tire. Yeah. Where did you find info on cultural lifestyles? I mean, how did okay, you? When you're talking about the flat, the the flat tire, you're talking about going under. They had, yeah, the, the, okay. Um, yes, and, and they had to flatten about, the tires. It wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't really a town. It was a big, that big um, uh, black family, big black uh, mm-hmm. farming family. Yes, yes. About. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so now ask, answer, tell me the question again. Where what did you answer? find information on the, their cultural lifestyle? Oh, okay. Well, Where did your research come up with that? Well, I made it up. Oh, well, <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I part of it. I actually did. Uh, uh, the Green Book came a lot in it because uh, you know I had them be have their own little motel. You know they had their little, little motel there, 
uh, and they, that was what the sign was about. So I knew that I could use that there. Um, and I also wanted to have this big family uh, because that's what happened. You know, all, all families, not mm -hmm. all farming families were huge back then, mm -hmm. you know, right. uh, and because they, you know, had to farm and they needed everybody's, they needed more hands to farm. And I just thought, how much fun would it be to have, um, how much fun would it be to have this big, 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 as in really big family and how, how much fun it would be to have them um, be getting in trouble right there. And have you ever, you know, I'm, I have this image of this old place near my hometown where um, a little, oh, it's a country road and the railroad track goes over and I tried to explain this, but the railroad track is, you know, you, it, it actually is a gully. They actually took the road and they went under it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what, so what this was, was that uh, that's what was happening. And, it, and of course we had the rig was too big, you know, too tall. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be a great complication? And what, how could they, how could we handle that? And of course, then we had to have nut, nut. I found out that, that a truck had to have, you know, double back tires. So I had to come up with something about that, of course. <laughs> and so we did, you know, so he didn't just have one type of higher problem. He had two. And at that point, they couldn't go anywhere. They had to have some, fun, some, some help. And what do you know? You know, the family was watching. Actually, it was the little girl. Do you know, when I first started this book, and I think I wrote this in the author's note, I kept having an image of a photo farm girl um, just, just staring out, you know, bored as to heck, and she's staring out the second when the second story of like a, you know, just a little, maybe not a shotgun house, maybe just a, you know, just some sort of little frame house uh, that on the road, because roads went right by, you know, mm -hmm. farms. They didn't, you don't talk about interstates way over there. You're talking about the, the you were right there. And she's looking out the window. This is my image. She's looking out the window and there go a couple of drafts. So, you know, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what did that girl, little girl, and you know, it happened. It had to happen because this is the kind of roads that, you know, were, were, they were traveling on. So here was this little girl and she sees this go by. What did she think? So I took that and, you know, I thought, how many times did that probably happen on that trip? You know, right. so, um, I took that and, 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 and added it to this story where it's the little girl who's in the shotgun house who sees it, sees the first thing, sees it first thing and probably tells everybody else about it. And Honeybee is her name. Um, and essentially, um, but, but back to the story, back to asking me, you know, uh, where I got all that is um, I realized that I wanted, I knew I was going to put a sundown town in, in the book. Now that was going to be later, you know. So I wanted to balance it. I wanted to show a very powerful black family. Mm -hmm. If I had to show a sundown town, and how could I not, you know, uh, in this kind of story? If I wanted to show a sundown town and what that means, and if you read the book, you know what that means. Then in this powerless sort of feeling this poor if con man had, you know, uh, because he had to get through there, and yet he had a wreck and he couldn't do anything. So. First, I wanted to show how powerful uh, they, that culture could be. And, and it was. I mean, we all know, we are knowing more and more about what, the, what it was like uh, back then for, uh, you know, uh, it was very separated, of course, Jim Crow. But they had some mighty, mighty powerful uh, communities. And that's, I felt like it would be, you know, really wonderful juxtaposition. You need to have the uh, really black powerful family first who saved them and then they save you know the pecan man uh, and get him through this sundown town this participant says i loved your book on audio but he or she was wandering about the onions in the pockets why why'd you choose onions and what's all that about oh the onions oh that i did not make that up <laughs> I love that. I did not make it up. Uh, the um, I have a, uh, uh, you know, well, you've seen them, the news articles. I bet you thought I made those up. I hope you, I hope all of you, I think I even said it, tried to make a real point of it. 
that when I took some literary license in those dozen that are, that are sprinkled throughout the book, those are really the real newspaper articles. I changed the names, uh, changed the titles, did a little bit of this and that, but the content themselves is the same. And the one that from the San Diego Union, which was the San Diego Union paper, uh, that was almost exactly the way it was, um, that I, at the very end, uh, talks about, uh, I had that one, you know, and that one said that that's the only way they got them out of the crates once they got there with, by giving them onions. They wouldn't, it didn't want the acacia leaves, didn't want any of this stuff. And so finally they tried onions and, you know, I never heard of that. Yeah. So I thought that is insane, you know, that they like onions. What, okay. Do they have onions on the Savannah in Africa, you know, but <laughs> They like them and they use them in the story. I mean, in the real story. And so, uh, in fact, I think the quote is, onions have power. And I think that's what, I think uh, Charlie Smith, who the man I, um, that uh, is the, the head zookeeper that, um, that I patterned Riley Jones uh, after, uh, he, um, he, he was quoted saying that in, in that article. So I just ran with it. You know, I started from the very beginning and just had them, you know, I plot, put the onions all the way through. And, and it made sense to me because when they'd wanted to do something, they, they pretty much had to, had to, you know, rob them because they're big. <laughs> you know? Okay, kind of so a wrap up question. What can we do to help giraffes and other endangered animals? Oh, isn't that a serious one? And it's, serious, it's just a serious question. I just wish uh, I had the, the perfect answer to, but uh, one of the major things you can do, and I mentioned, I think this in the author's note, what I think possibly the only thing we can do, you know, it's kind of like how we feel about all the other things, uh, all the other problems in the world. We've got so many right now. And so, you know, what some people would say, you choose one thing and you do whatever you can. You donate, you, you, you volunteer and you donate uh, money as, as you can. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, others say that, um, that there isn't any hope and I, we've got to have hope. So, so what, I mean, you know, just you and I, who, the people just like us, what do we do? What can we do? It's a great question. And I guess my major answer would be um, to choose, do your research and then choose one organization you want to, to, um, to support that is doing the work that you really think needs to be done. Now, I, of course, have a sweet spot for the San Diego Zoo Global. It's what they called it when I was there because um, it's now called the San Diego Wildlife Alliance, but it's essentially, uh, they were all over the world. That's why they, taught, they added global to the word because they are out there. They have biologists, they have, and, and this is a lot of conservation organizations are doing this. Um, you know, all of them really are in many ways. Ottoman, Sierra, all of them are doing it. You, they're doing something. Um, you need to choose which one that you want to. And if it's, if, if endangered species is, your th is something that you really feel very strongly about trying to help, um, the best thing I think to do would be to choose a conservation organization uh, that, at, that works with, uh, these, with zoos or with um, uh, parks or with, or with uh, you know, organizations around the world. There are so many of them, but you have to kind of do a bit of research to find out. Or you can simply just, you know, give to the San Diego Wildlife Alliance, you know, <laughs> that could be a simple one. Uh, you have, um, you have to do something. You know, you have to feel like you can do something. You know, we, we can't talk, we don't talk about overpopulation, I noticed, because that talks about people. And we can't really talk about, some, for some reason, we can't talk about um, uh, holding our population down. But it's it's more and, and that's really part of what's happening. You know, the, you know, we we don't have any wild places for them. It's not that the zoos can what the what the zoos. That's why it's really important to 
connect with someone, the, the groups that are actually going out to the wild mm -hmm. and trying to do something there. They're trying to, the, these, these field biologists, that's what they're called, they will go out and they will try to save, you know, the silverback gorillas, for instance, and that sort of thing. And they will try very desperately to do that. Now, I do know that also a lot of, uh, um, uh, you can also do, um, it's, well, it's, I don't think it's called eco tours, but you can actually, you know, just by doing some of these um, tourist things uh, in other countries, and it may be even here too, uh, you can, um, you're paying, for the experience, but you're also supporting the organizations. Uh, there are there are ones that are not good, of course, and you'll you know if if you go uh, cheap, you probably would find them sadly. But um, it, but just you know keep your eyes open and um, and choose one, and then keep your eyes keep keep on keeping your eyes open and doing more research, and then you can always you know you might fall in love with another one later and be able to support them. What else can we do? We've got to do something though, right? Right. Belinda? All right, um, that is about time. So we're gonna start wrapping it up. We did have one more question come in, Linda. Okay. Um, do you know if this is going to be adapted into a film or a series? Would you oh. <laughs> be adapted? Yeah, yeah. Um, boy, do I get that question a lot. You know, and my answer to that is, uh, from your lips to God's ears, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I um, I had the great fortune of um, my first novel. If you read the back of the, I think I mentioned it in my bio, um, having Catherine Deneuve uh, with it, they made a French film out of it. Oh my gosh, it was amazing to to be. I, I I'm still not. It's surreal. You know, um, so I'm hoping that this happens here because I will actually be able to, you know, you know, not only have to not know French, but <laughs> but I'd also be able to go and watch. And oh my gosh, I don't know. Uh, the answer, really, the real answer is um, that I've been getting uh, nibbles. Uh, these things take a while. I'm not, uh, and especially with COVID, can you imagine? I. I, I'm, I don't even know how many they're trying to make movies. They're really, but I, I can't imagine they're doing as much as they, they did before. Uh, but anyway, I've had nibbles. I've had one or two really good nibbles and we're gonna see where that goes. Um, they, they find me and then I send them on to, to my agent. And uh, at that point, um, you know, I mean, this, I was just thinking this one person who just, told me, he just kept on telling me his cred, you know, his, his credentials. And I thought, oh my gosh, just stop talking and go write my agent, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you convinced me, now go, you know, get the money and go on, you know. But uh, anyway, that's, that's all that to say. It's a laughable thing to say is this is crazy stuff. And, and when you get into this part, uh, there's also a couple of problems there. And you might as well, I might as well tell you what the writer, how the writer really feels about this, right? Absolutely. And you, you, you'll probably get a kick out of this. Uh, I was thinking about what would have happened if I'd gotten a, um, I, if I'd gotten an offer from a, an American company to make my first one. Now this was a little small town, Texas. It was an um, old lady who was who was had a garage sale and from over at Precious, Precious, Precious Antiques. And, uh, and I realized that I was so incredibly happy that it was French and <laughs> they changed, you know, a lot of things, you know, but, in it, but not a whole lot. They used some of my best lines, but, um, but they had to change, you know, to make it more French. But if I, I cringe now thinking about who they would have gotten to play, I mean, in the, in the Texas accents, oh, that could have just driven me nuts. You know, if I were really bad, you know, so part of me is thinking, um, OK, I'm holding my breath. But but, you know, what I've heard over the years and decades, um, I think Faulkner, I think, was the one that said it best. But he actually went out there and, uh, you know, it was a screenwriter for a while. William Faulkner, I don't know if you all know that, 1930s, but um, <laughs> he actually said, you need to stand outside of Hollywood and let them throw money at you. And then you walk away, you know? So in essence, uh, I hold my breath 
I'd love to think that it's going to be something wonderful, but that can be two different things. It can be a, it can be a, something wonderful for them, and then it would drive the rider crazy because they, you know the stuff they'd have to cut out, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not will not be in my hands, you know. And that's essentially what the, that's the worst part of it. It's not in your hands after a while. Your baby is not in your hands after a while. It just and so that will that's what a rider is worrying about. All this stuff, you know. Uh, but you know. As uh, as that great line from uh, what was um, uh, from oh, what was the movie with uh, Ted? I mean, uh, Tom Cruise in it. Yeah, Show me the money. So I essentially <laughs> just think, well, all right, we'll talk then. My goodness, you know, and we'll see. But uh, he was actually throwing this other this one. Well, two of them had started throwing out people who they would try to get to do it. And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, really stop. You just go call somebody, you know, just don't talk to me anymore um, because I liked them. But that doesn't mean that they, that they will choose people that I, you know, think live up to my characters, right? But uh, I hope if it does get done, uh, it could be years. Uh, I think, I think Forrest Gump was like seven or eight years in between, in between that, uh, the book and the, uh, and I recall the the, the uh, Winston Groom, the I think that's his name, uh, who wrote the book, saying, um, "Where were all of you when I was writing the book?" You know, <laughs> I don't think it resolved that well. <laughs> but uh, so you have the writer is kind of gets a little even crazier on this kind of thing. And at this point, I'm just uh, hoping I would I would love the fact that I'd have you know two books that were made films out of. We, we'll just see. But uh, again, nibbles. But that's all right at this point. And the moment that I know anything different, I will probably, you know, you'll be hearing me shout it from the, the you know, rooftops or something like that. But it'd be, it'll be fun. All right. Well, thank you so much, Linda, for joining us, um, for visiting with us. I, I know I learned so much from you. I got to sit down on the school okay. session as well, and that was a lot okay. of fun. Um, I want to say again, thank you to Sterling Bank. They are the ones who have sponsored our book in the bluff this year and all the wonderful events that we have um, gotten to do. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Sterling Bank. We did wanna announce the Friends of the Library raffled off a very large giraffe. If you've been in the library in the last couple months, you saw a nice big giraffe um, kind of hanging out in the trees <laughs> in our ceiling. And the winner of that was Blaine Ray. And so he is the lovely, proud parent slash owner of a beautiful giraffe. Um, but again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Linda, for taking the time to sit with us and Mary Ann for moderating and keeping that conversation going. It's been so nice to listen to you ladies talk today. Well, thank you. I do thank want to you. say that y'all have done a bang up job I, uh, there in Poplar Bluff. Uh, all the things that you've uh, done and, and, and all the things that we've done and it, you, you, uh, you created quite a, a, a one wonderful event. So uh, a month of events. So you should be proud of yourself. Well, thank you for that. We've had a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> Yes. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful night. Uh-huh.